Press Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Hoffman. This is another Catastrophicon edition. We're only a couple weeks out from the big show. So we have a special guest today, Paul Castiglia. He is a writer. He's known for Archie's Weird Mysteries and a ton of other stuff. Paul, welcome today. Hey, thank you, Dave. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming. So, Paul, tell us, uh, you know, you're the writer of Archie's Weird Mysteries. Tell us, why don't you start telling us a little bit about that? And then, uh, well, I know you have a lot of things you're working on and everyone's going to be excited about. Sure, sure. Well, I wrote and edited comic books for many years uh, for Archie. I did some stuff for DC, Dark Horse, a whole bunch of independent publishers. Uh, my longest running title that I wrote was Archie's Weird Mysteries. Uh, it was based on the classic animated TV show, but now classic, uh, from the late 1990s, early 2000s. And we did 34 issues and three and a half years worth of comics based on it. Uh, and it, it was uh, just a lot of fun, you know, because for me, I'd always um, gravitated towards mixing horror and comedy. Uh, you know, I kind of came into it when I was a kid. I loved Abbott and Costello and Laurel and Hardy and the Three Stooges. And a lot of times they would get mixed up in spooky situations. So I was working um, on staff at Archie Comics at the time when the Archie's Word Mysteries TV show was in development. And I was kind of the liaison between Deke Entertainment, which was the animation studio and Archie Comics. And I was kind of supplying them with reference stories that they could use. And as I was working on it, I just thought, yeah, I really want to write a comic based on this. So I convinced management, hey, let's do a spinoff comic and please let me write it. I had already been do writing some things for them here and there. I'd written some various Archie stories, uh, some Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, some Sonic the Hedgehog, uh, but I really wanted them to write this. And once I had an opportunity to do it, it was great because I took all of that type of stuff that I loved growing up and I infused it into my script writing. So you'll see a little bit of Abbott Costello meet Frankenstein in there. You'll see a little bit of Kolshak the Night Stalker in there. And you'll see a little bit of one of my favorite 1980s films, Night of the Creeps in there. Uh, all those things were very um, inspirational to me when I was writing Archie's Word Mysteries. Uh, so when you contacted me about this, I thought, oh, this is a nice, nice convention for me to do because there's that horror element and I could kind of bring the fun aspect of horror into it. Um, you know, one of the projects, one of the projects I'm working on, how you got to me, as I recall, is, is a book called Scared Silly, which is a book where I'm reviewing classic horror comedy films uh, from the 1920s to the 1960s. And you had contacted me through my blog about this. And I said, oh yeah, I gotta, I gotta jump on this. So I appreciate it for sure. Fantastic. Can you tell us what about, uh, you know, Archie is domiciled in, uh, in Westchester, their That's headquarters. Correct. Yeah, I think it's in Pelham. Um, what, what it just for, since it's a hometown, oh, by the way, it, it, I love coincidences. And when I spoke to, um, I don't remember her last name, I think her first name is Nancy, CEO now of Archie. Uh, she is from where I grew up and she mentioned a restaurant in my town of Allendale called um, the, the AB&G, Allendale Bar and Grill. And when she mentioned that as the getting to know you thing, that is right across the street from the barber shop where I used to read Archie comics. So, <laughs> How I, funny I like, is wow. that? And yeah. it's happening again. Happening again, you don't even know it because um, Cold Check the Night Strangler is written by Richard Matheson, who is also yeah. from Allendale. So, um, oh, Richard Matheson's well. great. He's one of my all time favorite writers. He was terrific. Uh, yeah, Archie is in Pelham now. And uh, when I worked on staff there, uh, it was in Mamaroneck. Mm -hmm. And so I worked in the office in the 1990s in Mamaroneck, and then I uh, left that office job and went full-time freelance for them for a bit. But uh, yeah, they definitely have their their Westchester roots. I think prior to Mamaroneck, they were a Manhattan uh, company, like a lot of, you know, Marvel and DC were Manhattan for many years. I mean, Marvel's still in Manhattan, actually, I believe. So, What is, what is it about Archie that uh, lends itself to this kind of uh, weird adventures Theme. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, with Archie, uh, they had caught on to that pretty early on. Uh, part of that had to do with the monster kid craze. Uh, so in the late uh, 1950s, Universal put together the package of classic Universal Monsters films for syndication. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you got things like uh, Chiller Theater and, and um, 
fright nights. You know, local TV stations would buy the package of films and then they would hire a local host sometimes in uh, some kind of, you know, spooky costume or makeup uh, to host these things. And they created this whole army of monster kids, you know, before our time, uh, you know, these kids in the late 50s, early 60s were, were growing up with this. So Archie early on in the early 60s, they kind of caught wind of it. And a lot of the covers to some of their uh, it, uh, comics, they had titles like Laugh and Life with Archie and, and different things like that, Pep. Uh, they would start to feature these gags where monsters would turn up. Like there's a couple uh, covers where they had Creature from the Black Lagoon on it, the Frankenstein monster, Dracula. So they kind of caught on to what was happening in the zeitgeist. And ultimately they started writing stories like that too. So you start getting in the late sixties, you start getting stories where Archie and the gang are mixed up in haunted houses and also Josie and the Pussycats, which was also an Archie Comics creation. They would have their, their haunted house adventures. So it kind of would come in and out of the comics throughout the 60s, 70s and 80s. And it, it kind of fell out a little bit in the 90s. Uh, but then once Deke said, hey, we want to do a, an Archie's Word Mystery show, it kind of came back in vogue. And then we had the the title to do it in Archie's Weird Mysteries. That's great because I was uh, I wrote a social media post when uh, we confirmed John Dugan, who played Grandpa in the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that uh, that movie has a lot of nuance to it, and one of the uh, components of it is that it's actually a spoof of this kind of thing, where a bunch of young people stumble upon a nefarious, dangerous place. But obviously, that particular movie uh, maybe takes a, a sense of realism as to what might happen to a bunch of. Uh, you know, goofball teenagers stumbling into a house of horrors, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, it makes me wonder if Sam Raimi was reading Archie comics in the '60s. You know, when you look at Evil Dead Two and Army of Darkness, yes. those are more on the the farcical side of things, as right. a lot of the '80s stuff was. Absolutely. So, tell us a little more uh, about uh, what else you're working on. Because I know you have a long list of really fascinating, uh, fascinating, uh, and it's a it's a very diverse list too. So, let us what what else you want to tell us about? Oh yeah, well you know. Um, Right now, you know, I've, I've done, well, I done, did a lot of comic book writing and editing, did some animation writing. Uh, one thing that might be of interest, uh, I was working for Mattel for many years, Mattel Toys, and they had Thomas the Train. And at one point, they decided to do a new toy line where Thomas got mixed up in fantastic situations. Oh, wow. like, like a sci-fi type of thing. It was called Thomas and Friends Adventures. And so we had him in outer space. We had him fighting sea monsters. Oh. We had him fighting like sharks the size of jaws. And uh, again, that was one of those ones where I inserted myself. I was already working on the copywriting for the toys. And I said, hey, let's do something with this. Let's make accompanying comic books and animation. Uh, we had done a couple things too with DC Super Friends, Batman, Superman, where we had a mashup where we had these mini uh, Thomas figures, we we called them minis, and where they were painted to look like Batman and Superman. So I got to do a few of those too. So we were kind of taking Thomas and branching him off into these fantastical adventures. And I was very grateful and thankful to be able to work on those uh, comics and and animations for the for those special Thomas stories. So there was that. Uh, I'm also working on a special project. Uh, it's going to be a Kickstarter funded. Uh, there's a fellow named Bob Fermanac, who is a great film historian and author and restorationist. Uh, he co-wrote uh, one of the seminal books on Abbott and Costello called Abbott and Costello in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And he's the president of 3D Film Archive. And they've been doing a lot of restorations uh, over the past decade or so. Uh, a lot of 3D films that they've restored and also a lot of Abbott and Costello films. And one of the films they just restored uh, is Robot Monster. Mm -hmm. They restored it to its original 3D brilliance. It looks fantastic. Uh, Bob gave me a private screening of it. Uh, and- Do you uh, think 3D is that old school, those those uh, cardboard glasses? Well, the, well the, the whole thing about 3D that a lot of people don't realize is the 3D that when it was originally in theaters was polarized. It was the, the more upgrade uh, you know, um, how would you put it? Like the um, more deluxe 
treatment of the glasses. It wasn't the the red and orange to start. The anaglyphic actually came a little later. So Bob's crusade is about restoring these things to their original, um, you know, brilliance, the polarized way, you know. Uh, so he restored that, and the DVD uh, just came out to backers, and I think it's just been made publicly available. Uh, when you buy the DVD, you do get an, an anaglyphic option, so you do get the cardboard uh, glasses too. But if you have a, a 3D equipped television, you already have polarized glasses as well. Oh. Um, he's screening it live. I think by the time this goes up on YouTube, the New York City screening may have already happened. Uh, it's that's June 24th. Uh, we're screening this. We're we're doing this interview the day before that, and then there's a um, screening coming up in Los Angeles on July 1st. Uh, so it's a great film to see with a crowd. Uh, so uh, long story short, uh, Bob uh, came to me and said, hey, what about a, a, a robot monster comic book or graphic novel? I said, yeah, definitely. I said, I already know people who would be on board for that, different artists uh, that I've worked with in the past uh, and writers. So uh, we're putting together a uh, graphic novel uh, with various stories in it and in 3D. Three new, new stories? Monster. They're new stories. They're they're based on Robot Monster and the restoration. And um, it's going to be great. We're going to crowdfund it. And hopefully, uh, you know, people will be on board for it the way they were for the, the DVD and Blu-ray that just came out. And um, it's fantastic. We have some really cool people on board. Howard Buckles. Uh, from Mystery Science Theater and also Archie Comics, who you uh, have interviewed, is also going to be at Catastrophicon. He's yeah. one of the people who will be contributing to it. And uh, so far, we have a few other folks lined up. Uh, we haven't made an official announcement yet, so I want to keep that under wraps. But if you come to Catastrophicon, I will be able to tell you who's involved. So there's another reason to come to Catastrophicon. Yeah, and I love it's that you guys really are cool. Yeah, I, I, that's awesome. And I love you guys are giving more texture to these old uh, properties. Um, like I was telling Harold when when I spoke to him that uh, I never observed peanuts from an adult's eyes before. Once I became an adult, I just thought of plush toys and balloons and uh, watching these people who know the writers and the artists really deconstruct what, what gave it longevity was amazing. And Oh, yeah, so you're referring to Harold's great unpacking peanuts. Podcast. Yes. Yes, I should have said who are, that. Who are uh, watching this? Uh, it's terrific. I mean, uh, there's there's so much going on in that strip, and it, it's really revolutionary. So, by all means, everybody, uh, like and subscribe and listen to Unpacking Peanuts, and like yeah. and subscribe to this channel as well. Um, Please, yes, yeah. <laughs> good work that Dave's doing. Uh, you know, between all of his different events uh, and and adventures in in marketing and and pop culture love. Thank you. And uh, the, I, what I wanted to emphasize, though, is you're um, bringing us back. This is I don't even remember that. I already forgot the name of the robot, <laughs> the movie we were just talking about. But here's oh. the thing. there's so many old movies and like most of them aren't great. So you re rely on the people who love them to not just tell you, obviously, they have to recommend them. But for you to go deeper than this, bring it back. You know, let us watch it in 3D, write a comic book if we want to go deeper, because it's something that's old. It's it's uh, oh, it's wonderful. Been... There's a wealth of stuff out there that's just fun. Um, you know, Bird Eye Gordon used to do great films like Earth versus the Spider. Uh, Sam Kassman produced a bunch of really cheesy but fun things. You know, and I love these things. And and one of my favorites actually is Vincent Price. Yes. Uh, Vincent Price did so many great horror films. A lot of them are tongue in cheek and comical because he was that way. Some of them are serious. Uh, you watch a film like The Last Man on Earth or Witchfinder General, and those are, those are pretty serious films. But then there's things like The Bat or The Tingler or House on Haunted Hill that are just hilarious. And I had a great opportunity a number of years back to contribute a chapter to a book about Vincent Price. It was published by Midnight, Midnight Marquee Press. It was part of their actor series. And in the chapter I wrote, I concentrated on the films that Vincent Price made with Peter Lorre, oh. because they made three films together and they they work very much like as if they're like the horror film version of Abbott and Costello or Laurel and Hardy. 
They have yeah, some of that great give and take. It's the Raven uh, and the Comedy of Terrors. And they have a segment uh, in the middle of Tales of Terror, the Black Cat segment too, where they team up. And uh, it's just great fun. And I'm actually going to be having copies of that book available at Catastrophicon. So another reason to come, I'll also have Archie's Weird Mysteries, some collections and some loose copies as well uh, to, to sign there. So, and, and Harold and I will be there together. You could talk to us about the Robot Monster comic book. You could really talk to us about anything. Harold will have a lot to tell you about Mystery Science Theater 3000. I believe he's gonna have uh, some copies of the comic book there if he has any left. Uh, so, so yeah, we're we're ready and willing and able to welcome the fans. You know, I'm also going to try to bring, depending on my stock, some Sonic and Turtles things that I worked on because I know there's always people who like Sonic the Hedgehog and and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, so I'll try sure. to have that on hand as well, and uh, it should be great fun. You know, most of all, you know, it's Harold and I are the type of guys who like to meet people who like the same stuff that we like. So for us, it's really an opportunity to do what we love best and talk about these things. Yeah, a friend of mine, fans, uh, you know? a friend of mine who's coming is a real big uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fan, so I'll definitely make sure to introduce it to you. Cool, cool. That'd be great. And, and I have to, uh, you know, this is a, uh, you know, this, this world of fandom can, uh, um, people can get obsessed on things and I'm no exception. So I have to point out Last Man on Earth, which you mentioned a couple minutes ago, Richard, Richard Matheson again. That's I Am Legend, right? Oh, so yeah, like, sure. That's, that's Richard Madison. I Am Legend. Absolutely. Also, it's going back in on Allendale, New Jersey. I don't know why, but there's something going on there. That's where I'm well, from. It's, what's funny about that film is he took his name off of it because they changed the ending. Oh, interesting. And, and yet, it's the probably the most faithful adaptation of the book. There's I was going to say, like, the ending of the Will Smith movie was no, horrendous, right? No, no, his name is on that one. By that time, I think he just figured I'll put my name on it, but... But yeah, there's four versions of that, I think, now. There's there's the, the Omega Man with Charles yeah. Heston, the Will Smith one you mentioned. And then there was one with Mark Dacascus called I Am Omega. Oh, okay. Low, it was a low budget. It might have been from the asylum. Uh, you know, one of their, um, uh, what do they call those? They have a name for them. Uh, Mockbusters. It might have been one of their, you know, kind of, oh, you might confuse this for the Will Smith one. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, type of oh, thing. Back, back in the blockbuster video days. I got, is that, so you're talking about when they had the video that looked very similar to the one you liked. So you yeah, got another yeah, one. yeah, yeah. So, so there's at least four of them that I know, but I, I'm pretty sure. Like I haven't really watched the Mark Dacascus one, other than bits and pieces. But I'm pretty sure the Vincent Price one is still the most faithful. But you know, you talk about coincidences. Uh, you had uh, reminded me off uh, camera that you have. Uh, a fellow coming who uh, was once a member of the rock band The Misfits. Yeah, and um, Bobby Steele is of the Undead. He's going to Bobby Steele. So I have to I have to mention that um, that uh, I have a connection to The Misfits. Uh, Jerry Only is actually my dad's godson. Wow. Uh, and Jerry's a good guy. I've, I actually jammed with him a few times. Uh, at one point, we were going to work on a comics project together. Uh, but then, uh, you know, other things evolved in a different way for him. So that never came to be. But uh, he's a really cool guy. So um, that gives me a little bit of street cred for sure. <laughs> in, in the horror world, in the rock world. So, yeah, yeah. and everyone, everyone out there should know that Paul's been a good friend of the show as we've been putting it together, making introductions, giving us suggestions, helping market. So uh, come and definitely come and uh, he's got a lot to share with you uh, when we get there. Uh, anything else about the show you want to uh, remind everyone to get excited about? Well, I mean, come. well, this is the how, I mean, come on. You see conventions promoted all the time, right? But when you see them promote, promoted as, you know, rock and roll, horror films, and comics, you know, like that's a really cool mix. And you don't see that. And it's in a castle. Come on. I mean, really. How are you going to get a cooler convention than a, than a convention that's held in a castle, right? Well, hold on. You know, it's a haunted castle. Oh well, I might be leaving early then. Well, because, I've been you know, I've been assured. I just did a one of my um, volunteers uh, who who goes to the school there. Uh, her name is Maya, and she uh, gave me a tour, a haunted mansion tour. She showed me the secret rooms. She showed me. She told me about the flickering lights. Uh, she showed me where the nuns are buried out back. There's an actual a graveyard out back that has nuns from as far back as uh, 
1800s. Uh, the oldest one I, I observed was April 9th, uh, was the day she died in 18 something, which again, with the coincidences, my little obsession, uh, my first event, the Hudson Valley Music Summit was on April 9th, which is also the day Jerry Garcia died. Um, also, I think Charles Manson, I think happened on April 9th. So uh, there's well, that's a, lot a, bad of, one. a lot of rock and roll, a lot of, uh, you know, slasher uh dates you know for those of you who believe in dates we have you know that's this is the right place for you to come we have um uh i believe uh steve barton uncle creepy's a medium uh so we'll get to the bottom of this whole haunted thing because uh, i think i'm going to be scared silly if i stay yeah. there too long <laughs> there see what happens i mean people come in here and laugh and smile because i want to have fun and i don't want to be scared yeah uh, and honestly, that's all that's all that is really what it's about because people have said to me like oh i don't know i don't like scary stuff i'm like right but they're actors they're not you know they're not like yeah. in it's not a, it's not a haunted house. It's a really right. it's for people who want to go behind the scenes and meet the actors, people who want to go behind the scenes and talk to the people who wrote these things or the people who are the histor the amateur or even professional historians on these franchises cuz super fans do that. Um if you ever had a conversation, they can really bring you to great places. If you really know how to listen to someone who's obsessed with a show or a movie or or a band, listen to them because they know where the good parts are. They know the better parts and the stuff you may have heard. Sure. Um, and uh, that's really what this is going to be about. Uh, I'm going to go back and promote my phrase, fanboy energy, that insatiable drive of super fans to get closer to their favorite franchises and artists using their own creativity. And that's why we have people crossing modalities. So we have Ari Lehman, who was the Jason in the original Friday 13th, has his band First Jason. Uh, so it's a heavy metal band and he's a jazz musician. So he's got a lot of talent, but he also had this brand of being the guy who played Jason and he, he pivoted, uh, which is a entrepreneur term. It's what you do when you pay attention to your market, you, when you combine uh, what the market wants with what your skills are and what you can give them. And he pivoted and he came up with this band who is our headliner. That's gonna be the end of the show is them. Um, and uh, that's just one great example. Uh, there, there's tons yeah, of- Yeah, and, and, and the thing about it is one of the key things you said here is that to just be able to talk to the people behind the scenes because you know, there's a lot of great podcasts out there that talk people. There are a lot of great guests on these podcasts talking about all this stuff. Oh, yeah. It's all awesome and wonderful. I listen to a lot of podcasts that go behind the scenes on vintage films and TV shows that I love. But here, you're going to get it straight from the horse's mouth yourself. You're the interviewer. Yeah. You show up. You show up and you could go right up to one of your favorite actor or actresses boots and ask them the questions about one of your favorite movies and they'll and they'll share you know some of their stories and experiences with you and it doesn't get better than that so we hope yeah. you really will take advantage of this being right in your backyard in westchester come out catastrophic on july 15th you you won't regret it yeah the amount of times i found myself yelling at the podcast because the podcast is not asking the right question uh, this time you you're in person, you're the podcast, you ask whatever questions you want. And the other thing, uh, you know, other nuance here is when you listen to a podcast, a uh, podcast are pretty good because they're long form, but a lot of times there's these standard kind of bullet point answers that these people say, if you look, follow people around the podcast world, you realize they're telling the same stories over and over. That's because that's kind of the pith that works or because there's some kind of promotion they want to do a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You get the real story. Okay. They can tell you the things that you're interested in. That's what the whole point of you asking the question is, you know, look, obviously I'm encouraging everyone to come and get an autograph, um, buy some merch, buy some, something that, uh, you, you weren't going to get anywhere, especially these comic books. You're probably not, uh, going to stumble on them, right? You could become the expert on that kind of thing. Um, but, uh, the conversation is really what it's all about. I mean, getting to know the person is wonderful. Absolutely. new. It just, we keep going deeper in a different direction when it comes to entertainment, uh, as our society, goes and i do want to mention this too you know we've sort of created a new economy we i mean i'm new i'm the new kid on the block with these uh cons but the convention world has created a new economy for your favorite artists because they might not be getting um royalties anymore especially the example i give someone in a band from 1983 that had you know three or four great hits and they're no longer in that band and that means you're not even if you do see the band in concert you're not giving them they're not getting a piece of that every time you listen to your cd uh they don't get any action, you know. Um, you can buy something directly from them, get a nice memento, and it goes directly in their pocket. I mean, that's like sure, a sure, sure, and that's really point. true too for like people who have been on TV shows. If their royalties have run out, or movie yep. movie folks get paid, you know, to do the movie, usually very few, little, get, few very few of them get royalty points. 
So, and you mentioned uh, you mentioned the the crowdfunding. You know, it it allows these folks um, who have a new idea, they want to give more, but their audience is too niche. Not, it's big enough for them. It's big enough for you, but they need to be able to reach you directly. So uh, beyond picking up a you know an, an autograph, um, try and get make sure they have your email so or you're following them on social media because everyone's got great ideas, especially when they've been. I mean, this is the thing. These guys who go to the, the these cons, they hear fan ideas all the time, right? So they're in a position to make something happen. Um, and not only that, we have filmmakers who are going to be there. We have writers. We have artists. Um, you know, I want this to be about collaborations and creative collisions. I want someone to go in there with an idea of that they're working on and come out with a completely different idea. And I want to be able to hear stories five, ten years from now, people who met at, at my event who uh, went on to create something wonderful. That's what I want to, that's, you know, ultimately, that's what I want to be able to create this laboratory for um, not just the the creative fans, the fans who want to, it's lo it's a wonderful talking to a fan who's really curating their collection. Um, and I want to, uh, them to be there, but I also want the folks who have these new directions they want to run in uh, to meet each other and, and, you know, see where we can go. Maybe one day we'll have a con based on people who met at cons, you know. Yeah, that would be amazing. Absolutely. Great. So, okay, Paul, well, thank you so much. I'm going to, uh, we can say goodbye now. Um, I'll, uh, um, and we'll see you in the, uh, on the other end. And thanks. Can't wait. For see you in a few weeks, Dave, and everyone else. Mm -hmm.